<clears throat> so we're back in uh, Hebrews 6, and um, thanks again for having me here. Uh, it's been great just to, to be among people who love being among each other and to feel like you're, you know, you're with them. It's great. It's been a good time, and um, glad to be back with you tonight. Uh, so tonight we're going to go back to Hebrews chapter 6, where we left off kind of this morning. And uh, my hope is that we will be able to kind of uh, resolve a little bit of the tension that we might have left with. Um, one of the things that's important to remember about Scripture as we study it, you know, week in, week out, it's not like link sausage. You know, you can't just cut it off and pick up the next time. You can. When you do that, you oftentimes lose some of, of the mental and spiritual um, awareness of where you were at when you left off. And so my hope tonight is to do a little bit of summary from where we were at this morning to kind of get us back into place where we were where we left off, and then we'll pick up and look at the, the final remarks concerning the, um, the hypocrisy of apostasy back in our text. So we'll kind of do a little bit of review, and then we'll pick back up where we were, just to kind of get us thinking back uh, where we left off. So we're looking at Hebrews 6. Specifically, we'll look at 7 and 8, but we'll do a little bit of, of review. Again, a lot of times whenever you've probably read or heard about Hebrews 6, it's one of those texts that can give a lot of unwarranted fear. But what I notice a lot of times we do is we go to texts like Hebrews 6 and we ask a lot of wrong questions from it. The first question people often ask before they even go to this text is, can believers lose their salvation, right? And we looked at that a little bit this morning. So many times we mistakenly do that, right? We go to a text and we ask questions from a text that it is not even intending to answer, or it's not addressing. And when we do that, we end up with some wrong conclusions. And then ultimately from those wrong conclusions, we draw some wrong deductions and make some wrong um, commitments. And then we end up in a kind of a world of peril, right? Because we end up in the wrong spot. So whether a Christian can lose their salvation or not is not the question the author is raising. Rather, he's presenting the reality that unbelievers who are self-deceived or even pretending in the congregation of the church, can be so cut off from the benefits of salvation that it becomes impossible for them to be redeemed. So the question is, again, not can believers lose salvation, but can unbelievers be forever lost, being so calloused by the external benefits of redeemed people around them that they cannot be, they become so hardened that they cannot be saved? Remember, that's what we looked at this morning, Hebrews 6, 4, and 5. Let me read it again, just to kind of get us back into context for tonight. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened, tasted the heavenly gift, have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good word of God and the power of the age to come, and then have fallen away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. Again, these are people who have known extraordinary blessing from God. They have lived among God's people. They have seen His benefits and in ways that we can hardly even imagine. They've experienced God's goodness displayed in miraculous ways. They've had the privilege of seeing liars forsake lying, to see drunkards forsake drinking, homosexuals forsake homosexuality, prostitutes forsake prostitution. They've seen some true conversions, yet seeing all of this, this person has in their heart decisively, in a comprehensive way, rejected Jesus Christ. I mean, think about this again. Many of these people in the congregation, maybe some of them, had actually seen the body of the Son of God in flesh. They certainly had heard the apostles, for they were hearing from one at this time, the Apostle Paul. They had heard it with their own ears. They had listened to the sermons of God's disciples. They had seen miracles performed by the apostles themselves. And you know what? Maybe some of them had even been healed. They had certainly, in ways unimaginable, tasted the heavenly gift. Again, sharers of, uh, partakers of the Holy Spirit tasted the Word of God. The Son of God had broken into their darkness. Again, think about all the privileges they had in those early days but we shouldn't remove ourselves too quick to just say, well, let's think about them without thinking about the privileges that we have as well. And they didn't have 66 books in their native language sitting in front of them every day. We have some tremendous blessings and privileges too. The harshness, as we looked at this morning, 
of condemnation is in proportion to the scale of gospel privilege that has been rejected. Kind of how we could summarize that. We see here in our text, we see God's patience has an end. And it's heightened in the face of those who have callously neglected the benefits of the gospel. Really, again, all the way up to chapter 5, it's that continued, repeated theme of the entire book of Hebrews. Jesus is better. He's better than the priests. He's better than the kings. He's better than the prophets. For he is the prophet, priest, king that they all aimed towards. He's of a better covenant. His sacrifice is permanent. So we come to this warning section. Remember, it's saying, if that's who Jesus is and you reject him, there are some dire consequences. Again, the consequences are damning. The consequences are inescapably, inescapably permanent. So our outline for this morning or for this afternoon, we'll kind of follow along our text again. We're going to look at the definition. Again, super kind of brief because we talked about it this morning. The definition of what is the hypocrisy of apostasy. We'll look at the ramifications, and I'll bring out some new points that we didn't get to have time to consider. But then we'll spend most of our time on that last section in verses 7 and 8, the fruit of apostasy. So this will be our opportunity to think about what does apostasy look like, or the fruit of it, the the tares of it, so to speak, or the snares of it, that can sneak up unguarded in loved ones around us or in our own lives that we can be aware of, so we might cut it out. Let me read our text again, the whole thing. I'll read 4 to 8, the whole uh, section, and then we'll jump right back into it. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and tasted the heavenly gift, have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, then have fallen away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucified the Son of God and put him to open shame. For ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it, and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled, receive a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. So briefly, what is apostasy again? It's a willful rejection of all former allegiance of Jesus Christ in the heart. Now, again, we might have struggled or thought about even this morning with the question of maybe that's talking about me. Maybe you're worried about committing the unpardonable sin, right? You worry that maybe you haven't been the best husband to your wife or you lost your temper with your kids. Or maybe you're lazy at work, right? You've perhaps fallen into a pattern of missing Bible study, or, or you've harbored a grudge against someone for far too long. And you sort of live with that guilt, right? You carry that dead body of sin around with you, maybe for days or weeks at a time. And if that's the case, you're probably quick to wonder, is, have I lost my salvation? Is this talking about me? Have I committed the unpardonable sin? Maybe you have a problem with cursing when you get angry. Maybe you're jealous of someone else, right? You like their job, their worldly possessions. Maybe you aren't very faithful in stewarding your own responsibilities that God has given you. Or maybe you have lustful thoughts or you fall into sin with porn too frequently. And you come to a text like this, you start to wonder, is this talking about me? Again, let me start by saying this. If that's the concern you have right now, it's likely a great indication that you're not an apostate. Remember, apostates aren't concerned with things like that. An apostate is not someone who really wants to repent, but, well, God is mean and won't let them. No. Remember, apostates don't want to repent whatsoever. They have no grief over sin. They see no need for repentance, no soul-nourishing delight in Jesus Christ to mark them. No, they don't want that, and they never really did. Remember apostasy in verse 6, that it isn't falling into sin. No, not at all. Remember, it's, as it says in the English there, falling away. We looked at that. It could be misleading. In a very specific sense, it's falling alongside of, remember? Falling alongside of, to be parallel with Christ, but to never really be united with Him, right? Again, what, that parallel idea, to come right up real close to the fringes, to be so close that they get the overflow of the benefits. 
but they never actually intersected with him, and they never will. So that's how we define it, real brief. Now let's look at the ramifications again. I want to highlight one more thing. I didn't get to spend as much time on this morning. I want to point out one thing to hear for most of you. If you're using the English Standard Version, or the New King James, or even the NIV, you'll notice verse 6 of Hebrews 6 doesn't have impossible in verse 6. The ESV says, And then have fallen away to restore them to repentance, since they are crucified once again, the Son of God, to their own harm, and hold them up to contempt. Maybe you see that. Now, the reason for that is because in the Greek, the word impossible appears at the very beginning of the section in verse 4. So it literally reads, and how it is in the ESV, impossible for those who have been enlightened, tasted the heavenly gift, the list of all those benefits, to renew them to repentance. Now, the NAS brings the word impossible down to verse 6, so you can get a better idea of what is impossible without nearly two verses of text to maybe lose your train of thought. And there's a reason why the apostle does this, though, and I want to kind of stress that because I think it's important we could have missed it. In the New Testament, when you want to place maximum emphasis on something, you don't write it in all caps, you don't underline it, you don't put it in bold, you put it at the very front of the sentence. So in Greek, to emphasize something, you take it out of where it might fall naturally in the sentence, and you put it up front. It's the first word. So it should be thought of as very emphatic. Impossible. 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 It starts right there. This very startling warning, that heavy burden, it's impossible. Without a doubt, for the apostate, repentance to salvation is impossible. It's unattainable. It cannot be done. The God who gives the gift of repentance, don't forget, remember, repentance is a gracious work of God, but for the apostate who slanders his son, through all of his benefits back into his face, God will not give that one repentance. And so because man is unable to repent on his own, he simply will not. He simply cannot because his heart is dead. In light of those things, salvation is impossible for the apostate. The word impossible only occurs four times in the book of Hebrews. Let me point this out to you because it's important for how we understand this. Hebrews 6.18. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. Hebrews 10.4. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, it is impossible to please him. A lot of times we like to soften the hard messages. Many commentators will soften the harshness of Hebrews 6, 6, and the impossibility of salvation for the apostate, and they interpret it as, well, it's really difficult. It's improbable. It's highly unlikely. Or maybe it's just very, very hard. But if we do that, What does that mean for the rest of these texts in Hebrews? That kind of thinking would call the truth, the holiness, the veracity, the sinlessness of God into question. It was merely difficult and not impossible for bulls and goats to take away sins. Then, well, Jesus didn't have to die at all on the cross, and men could save themselves. The word impossible means impossible. Again, it's that harsh finality of danger that cannot be escaped or minimized. So hopefully you see that. You see, you can't see all these benefits, be partakers of them, reject them, and be renewed. Again, that term to be renewed means to restore, to bring back to an original condition, so to speak. To think about that just for a moment, for an apostate to go back to that initial excitement of intellectually hearing good news and benefiting from it, the beauty of that kind of maybe the temporary joy they had in that, to move right up to Christianity, to come alongside of it for many, in some significant ways, for a long time maybe, to come to church regularly, get baptized, take communion, to maybe even for a time extremely turn from old patterns in life. A temporary, maybe superficial, external turning from sin, to give the appearance of coming to Christ, make a public profession, to come to the very fringe of salvation. 
When you reject Jesus Christ at the peak of experience of knowledge and conviction, salvation is impossible. There's no coming back for that. What I think also really important about this point is it tells us something, that God in his predetermined plan simply will never do. And so men left in their sinful state can't be renewed. You know, this may seem severe. You may wonder, why is God so severe with apostasy? Well, because it tells us something about his love for his dear son. They're saying what he did wasn't enough. He has to do it again. It wasn't enough the first time, and they're subjecting him to public humiliation. They've seen all there is to see, heard all there is to hear. They've benefited, again, in those profound ways, and then internally they turn their backs on Jesus. So what's he doing, the apostate? He's figuratively driving the spikes into his hands and his feet all over again. It simply cannot be done. They are adding their voice to the crowd and the multitude that said, His blood be on us and on our children. When a person turns away from God, when they forsake Christ and go back to the pleasures of the world, so to speak, that person says by their rejection that Jesus got what he had coming to him. Things in this world are worth more than him. They're worth more than the love of Christ, the wisdom of Christ, the power of Christ, and all the promises for us in Christ. When a person says that, they're saying, I agree with the crucifiers of Jesus. Because what could shame Christ more today than to have someone taste his goodness and his wisdom and his power and then say, no, there's something better and more to be desired in the world. That puts him to public shame. Again, their voice joins in the mob, crucify him. In a way, apostasy is way worse than actually the chance of crucify him by the crowds in Jesus' day. Did you ever stop to maybe consider that? We live after the resurrection, something they had never known. We live in the wake of the risen and ascended Lord. And that's why we meet on Sunday mornings and Sunday. And it's in the face of all of those wonderful benefits, truths about Jesus, they're willing in their rejection to re-crucify him. Something else I want to point out here too about this. Notice what it says about Jesus. It doesn't just say Jesus. It says the Son of God. Why, Why Son of God here, not Jesus? You know, a lot of times we use those two terms interchangeably, don't we? right? And maybe in some contexts they could be, but why is Paul here so deliberate to refer to the second person of the Godhead, the God-man Jesus Christ? Why specifically Son of God here? Well, he's continuing that wonderful theme that he introduced in the first verses of the epistle. Hebrews 1.1, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days he's spoken to us in his son. The same son whom he appointed heir of all things. The same son who made the world. The same son who is the exact representation of his nature and glory. The same son who upholds all things by the word of his power. The one who is superior to angels, to Moses, to Levi, to Aaron. After he made atonement for sins, the son who sat down Hebrews 1, 4, at the right hand of the majesty on high. That son. That son right there. And Hebrews continues that he inherited a superior name than the angels. He never said to an angel, you are my son, but to him and him alone, Hebrews 1, 5, you are my son. The son of God in the book of Hebrews puts on adorning display the exaltation, the majesty, the supremacy of Jesus Christ over all things He is God. And so in the face of that, the magnitude of rejecting Jesus is put on full display. The depths of depravity, the one they killed, the one they rejected, the supreme one over all the universe. And because of the Father's love for the Son, that intra-Trinitarian love to reject the Son is to spit in the face of the Father. And the Father sees that rejection And he says, that's enough. That's a line that cannot be undrawn. He will not tolerate 
humiliation of his son anymore. And so for all eternity, the apostates are outside God's grace. Paul says it again in Hebrews 10, I read this morning, 26 to 29, the fuller context. If we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? You know how severe of a thing it is to trample the Son of God underfoot? Well, it's permanent severity, right? No sacrifice remains, only the fearful expectation of judgment for adversaries. Apostasy is fatal, final. There's no coming back from it. To them, again, Jesus was an imposter, a deceiver. He got exactly what was coming to him. They agreed with those who killed Jesus, and they put him to open shame. Shame here actually connotates it's the word guilt. They declare openly Jesus is guilty, guilty, guilty. This is in, incurably anti-God. For those to be reserved the hottest places of hell, they take their voice with Demas, Simon, Magus, Judas, who walked and talked and ate and fellowshiped with God incarnate, yet rejected Him. Dangerous self-deception. Now, one thing we also have to remember, we can sit in church, hear good sermons, we can really maybe benefit from it, but we have to remember this. Tolerance is not the same thing as allegiance. Now, the time I really want to spend is on the fruit of apostasy. How do we see this coming? How do we evaluate it? How do we get a better idea about it? I want to look at the fruit of apostasy in this text. This is really where I want to spend most of our time that we have. Hebrews 6, 7, 8. For ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation, useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled, receive a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it's worthless, it's close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. What's the evidence or the proof that someone is tampering with apostasy? We see the same imagery used in Scripture actually time and time again, that idea of fruit bearing. You know someone is an apostate or in danger of it if they don't bear any fruit. Again, verses 4 and 5, we see all the benefits, and you know what about those? Those benefits we looked at this morning, none of those are fruit. They are not fruits associated with genuine faith. They all speak of experience. Yes, they had real experience. They speak of benefits. Yes, they had tremendous benefits, but those are not fruits. Matthew 7, 17 to 20, so every good tree bears good fruit. Every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. A very helpful cross-reference there. The land is sort of personified in this illustration. The land is blessed with rain like these people had been blessed with those five benefits we saw this morning. When those blessings fall upon the elect, what do we see? Genuine conversion. Genuine with faith. Genuine repentance. That's all fruit. And it's said to be blessed by God. But there are some who receive the same blessings, the same benefits, the same rain. But what does it yield? In the face of the same blessings, it produces thorns and thistles. It's worthless. And in the end, it gets burned. What do we see here? God's magnanimous general benevolence. We sometimes refer to that as God's common grace in Matthew 5, 45. God's so kind and gracious in blessing that what he gives flows onto evil, even the evil, unbelieving world around them. We see that illustration clearly here in verses 7 and 8. It's all about fruit. His point is simply this, you can't have faith in Christ and have absolutely no fruit, and you can't be fruitless towards Christ and expect you're genuinely saved. In other words, it always shows whether you're trusting in Christ. Trusting in Christ always has some kind of fruit 
not trusting in Christ always has fruitlessness. Then you look at a person's life, you can see what really animates them. It's like what Jesus meant when he said to the Pharisees and to his own disciples in Luke 6.45, the good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good. And the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. In other words, Jesus is saying, in the way you walk, in the way you live, you're showing people in the public sphere a snapshot of your heart. What you really care about, what, what's really, what you really believe in, what's most important to you, what, what rules your life. Now again, this illustration gives to us, again, is, is that your faith and your life go hand in hand, right? Your life is a witness to your faith or faithlessness. The author of Hebrews is doing this, especially in this context, because the people who openly had turned their backs on Christ had done it in their hearts, not externally. Right? They weren't marching out in protest out the doors. He's not hurling accusations at people while they're trying to leave. They're the people who are just coming and sitting, but in their hearts, they were really somewhere else. Verse 7 shows us genuine fruit, and it's important. It says, in bringing forth fruit, proper vegetation, it's useful receives a blessing from God. Genuine Christians are likened to a land that produces fruit in the harvest, like a vine that is, uh, that's fulfilling the purpose for which it was planted. Now, briefly, what is good fruit? Well, it's the, the fruit is that the Holy Spirit works in you. In other words, the Spirit tills the soil of your heart. He takes your heart of stone, gives you a heart of flesh, and He gives you a soft heart. He gives you spiritual life. So new life, new birth, new creation, a new heart. That's the first good fruit of the Holy Spirit. Second good fruit of the Spirit, faith. He gives you the gift of faith. He gives you eyes to see, ears to hear. He gives you faith so you can trust Christ and rest upon Him alone for salvation. And through this faith in Christ, again, justified, forgiven, declared righteous. Third, I'll go through these quickly. The good fruit of the Spirit is holiness and good works. It causes you delight in and walk in God's ways. It transforms you into Christ-likeness. That sanctification process that we look forward to in glorification as well. Galatians 5, 22-23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now, I could spend a lot of time about the beauty and joy of the fruit of a genuine believer. But I don't think Paul would want us to stop there for too long. He's giving us this illustration so we can be like fruit inspectors, so to speak. Not in some legalistic, bombastic way, but to kind of examine ourselves, to see if we're genuine or or fake. Next, verse 8, we see the hypocrites who are in danger of apostasy, they bear bad fruit. Or their evidence is really the opposite of fruit, I guess I could say. It's, it's described as thorns and thistles here. This kind of imagery is not new to the book of Hebrews. Uh, if you want to turn to Isaiah 5, Isaiah 5, I'll go there and then we'll come back so you can keep your finger there. It's a good cross reverence. I'll spend a little bit of time in it, so it's worth going there. Isaiah 5, 1 to 2. And I'll look at this text. It's a good parallel. Isaiah 5, 1 to 2. Let me sing now for my well-beloved, a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He dug it all around, removed its stones, and planted it with the choicest vine. And he built a tower in the middle of it and also hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. The Lord planted a vineyard. He tilled the land. He planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower to take care of it. He did everything that was necessary for his people. Verses 1 and 2. And what did the vine produce? Verses 3 and 4. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, Judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? 
worthless grapes. The vine produced bad fruit. It's a similar way of saying maybe thorns and thistles. And what will be their end of producing worthless grapes? Isaiah 5, 5 to 6. So now let me tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it will be consumed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled to ground. I will lay it waste. It will not be pruned or hoed, but briars and thorns will come up. I will also charge the clouds to rain on it no more. You see this parallel? Our text pictures the Lord's work as a laborer. After having plowed the ground, sown it, after watering it, blessing it with rain, the rain of heaven, and yet no good harvest comes from it, every wise man would leave off tilling it. He would say, my labor is wasted on such a plot of ground as this. Nothing more can be done for it. Nothing. For after having done my best to produce nothing but weeds, now it's useless and it needs to be burned. God goes to inspect the fruit, and what does he see? Nothing good. So he sees it as fit for nothing other than being burned. The language here in Isaiah 6 and or Isaiah 5 and Hebrews 6, that thorns and thistles, that should really sound familiar to us. I think it's the kind of thing that echoes through our souls, doesn't it? It was written on the core of your soul the day our father Adam fell. It was written on the very fabric of who you are as we were imputed with the guilt of Adam on account of man. Genesis 3, 17 and 18, cursed is the ground on account of you. You will toil and labor over it, and it will yield for you both thorns and thistles. Go back to Hebrews 6. The solemnness of these words, it's kind of bone chilling. It's worthless, close to being cursed. It ends up being burned. This is the awful fate confronting multitudes of deceived people who live in the church. Think about this. Across the landscape of evangelicalism, corrupt desires, pride, worldliness, covetousness are as plain in the world as they are in the church. For example, did you know that the divorce rate of professing believers is on par with the world? What a thought. Professing Christians close to being cursed soon to hear their last sermon, soon to be cut off from the land of the living, afterwards to hear from the lips of Christ the fearful sentence, Matthew 25, 41, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. When all that's possible for a piece of land has been done, it bears no fruit in the harvest, it must be given up. If the benefits of the Spirit doesn't result in genuine conversion, and that per- person is proven to be fruitless, to be given over to destruction, rejected by God. Now, little did the Jews believe this when they first heard those words uttered. Little did the pretenders of the Hebrew congregation, congregation believe it was about them. This is why there is an urgent need for every professing Christian to heed the words of 2 Peter 1.10, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. So this was a practical question that I want to consider after looking at that text. Or a few questions, really. Can we know who the apostates are? You know, we only think about that question in regard to the elect and reprobate, right? But it's really a similar question with regard to the apostates. Can we know who the apostates are? From our perspective, at what point in time Does someone's refusal render them beyond the hope of salvation? When does this happen in a person's life, this final cutting off? Well, let me tell you this kind of good news. Since many of you may be sitting here wondering, is my friend who hasn't been to church in a long time beyond salvation, should I even stop praying for them? Is my child who has run off into godlessness in the world beyond hope? How do we know? Are they totally cut off and hopeless? This is some of the good news. We don't know. The Bible doesn't say. And that should be encouraging news to us. 
It does happen? Yes. The Bible tells us it happens right here. It does happen, but it doesn't tell us who it happens to or when. It likely happens at different times in the lives of different people. God doesn't grant us that knowledge of who the apostates are for a reason. So what it means is this, that we never stop praying for the repentance and salvation of unbelievers. We take church discipline a whole lot more seriously. We may look at someone for time to time and wonder if they're an apostate, but because we don't know, and because we don't know, what that means is when we see someone, we actually get worried about them. We're quick to call them to repentance. We will continue to do so until there is no breath left in our bodies, right? To plead with them, to repent, and to come to Christ. But this illustration of the land tells us that though the Son is glorious, and though the message of the gospel, the message of the kingdom, the message of the word of God is glorious, there are people who will reject it. Again, it's possible to sit under the faithful preaching of the word of God and to not believe in Jesus. It's not the fault of the preaching of the word, it's a matter of the heart. You maybe you've had friends who you don't think, or who don't think they need to go to church, right? They think that, you know, they're right with God, but they don't really need organized religion. Maybe in the wake of a bad experience that they've had in a church, right? You know, they've been burned maybe by some people. Maybe they felt betrayed. Somebody let them down. Or maybe they've had a horrible experience. Perhaps it's perceived, perhaps it's legitimate. Some people do, again, have legitimate horrible experiences at some contexts in the church. And they say some, some of those kinds of really chilling things, right? I've tried Christianity. I've tried the church. I'm going to go do something else. I'm still spiritual. I'm still religious. I'm still good with God. But you know, Christianity doesn't work for me. You ever had a friend or a family member tell you that? Maybe you've even thought those things yourself. That's exactly what the author of Hebrews is talking about. You can't walk away from Jesus and not expect there to be some kind of consequence. Now, I'm not excusing perhaps some bad situations. Sometimes churches can really mess things up. But that's not a reason to walk away from Christ and His body. Jesus is the one person you don't walk away from. And Paul here is pleading with people who are sitting right in front of him. Think about that. Again, he's speaking these words to a congregation of people who showed up. Again, he's not talking to people who've already left. Again, he's not throwing things at them as they're walking out the door. He's dealing with people who are wavering in their hearts right in front of him. And he's saying, don't turn your back on Jesus. Don't walk away from him like the Jews did in the wilderness wandering. The illustration, again, our, he says in our text, when the blessing of the Son is spurned, Think about this, in a smaller degree, the, the author could have used any illustration he wanted to describe when apostasy happens, couldn't he? He could have said when good preaching is spurned. He could have said when common grace is spurned. He could have said when God's patience is spurned, or his goodness, or his generosity, or his love. But he doesn't attach to spurning all of those great blessings such a severe punishment. Spurning all of those great blessings such a severe punishment. You can spurn preaching. You can turn your back on God's common grace. People do that every single day. You can even disregard God's patience and and take for granted His benevolence. But if you spurn the Son, there's nothing left for you but to be thrown into the fire. And this morning and even today, we've seen what apostasy is. We've seen some of its damning ramifications. We've even seen the fruit, the lack thereof. It's one thing for a stranger in the faith to resist Christ. It's another thing for a person who has been in the church, been enlightened, tasted the heavenly gifts, partaker of the Holy Spirit, the good word of God, the powers of the age to come. It's another thing for that person to say, after all those blessings, I think the world offers something better. The re-crucifying of Christ, putting him to public shame, worse than anything that any outsider could ever do. Terribly serious is it to reject Jesus Christ? Thomas Watson said this, as there, was what, as there was but one ark to save the world from drowning, so there is but one Jesus 
to save sinners from damning. Psalm 2.12, do homage to the Son, that He not become angry, and you perish far. If you're worried today, again, what does our text tell us? What does this promise here in Psalm 2 tell us? It's, a, it's an encouragement, while you still breathe, to take refuge in Christ. Take hold of Him, of the, of the one garment that will fit you for heaven. The garment that is the robe of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Again, if you're feeling discouraged, maybe uh, you know, you're convicted of some sin in your life, Remember Psalm 51, 17. A broken heart, O oh God, you will not despise. You may think, well, I'm a pretty bad sinner. Remember the words of Psalm 51, 17 were written by a murderer and an adulterer. Blessed are those who take refuge in Him. And believers, take hope. Verse 9. But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you. And things that accompany salvation. Friends, if you've taken refuge in the Son, this is where you rest. I'm convinced of better things than apostasy concerning you, but things pertain to the beauty and the delight of salvation in the Son. And so we have here a, a great uh, form of assurance in the Son as well. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you today. We thank you for, again, this reminder from your word. We thank you that the contrite and the brokenhearted you always receive. Lord, that you do not reject your people. Lord, I pray that we would use this as an opportunity to continue in fervent prayer for unbelievers and straying friends. Lord, I pray that we'd use this text as an opportunity for us to take seriously the fruits of your word preached, the body of Christ, the fellowship of the saints, the building up of one another in love, of church discipline when it's necessary, that we might seek restoration because life is found in the Son and in the Son alone. In the name of our high priest we pray, amen.